boys and girls, Miss Block here. We are reading Loser by Jerry Spinelli, and we are on chapter 20. Nowhere. When is it over? Zinkoff doesn't know for weeks. He is only dimly aware of things. Dimly aware that as time goes by, he seems to be seeing less and less of Binz. He rides to Binz's house, and Binz isn't there. He phones. Binz says he has homework to do. He asks Binz this, asks him that. Binz always seems to say, I guess not. Even Vince's voice over the phone seems to shrug, seems to be looking into the beyond. And then, one spring day, on the way to school, Zinkoff sees a cluster of licorice spit marks on a sidewalk, and it makes him feel a little sad in remembery, and just like that, he knows it's over. And something new begins. On that same spring day, something happens to Zinkoff. An A happens to him. A's almost never happen to Zinkoff, absolutely never in major tests. But this was a major test in geography, his favorite subject, and somehow he has aced it. In fact, his A is the only A in class, a fact which Mrs. Schenkfelder announces while holding up his test paper for all the world to see. Zinkoff gets an ovation, his first ever. Several kids stand. Barry Haynes even whistles, though probably more to show off his whistle than to honor Zinkoff. Congratulations continue to pour in all day. Pats on the back, playful punches in the arm, hair musings. He wonders if it happened because he rubbed his lucky pink bubblegum stone before taking the test. In the playground, people want to see it. They snatch it from Zinkoff's hand and rub it over their faces and chest and under their arms like a washcloth, rubbing in the a juice, sighing, ah, and everyone laughs, and Zinkoff laughs hardest of all. Like gaudy birds, his name flies in new forms across the schoolyard. The Zink, the Z-Man, the genius, the Zinkster. It never occurs to Zinkoff that all the fuss is more than a simple A can account for. It never occurs to him that the loudest and showiest of his congratulators are really not congratulating him at all, but mocking him for blundering into the only A he is ever likely to get. Zinkoff does not see this. All he sees is that he seems to have acquired the power to make people happy. The very sight of him brings smiles and twinkly eyes to his schoolmates. Spotting him, boys jerk to a halt, plant their legs as if straddling a motorcycle, thrust a pair of finger pistols at him and bellow, there he is. Hands sprout like weeds to be high five. Yo, Zink! As he comes to the dinner table one night, he stands for a moment at his chair. He thumps his chest with his fist, declares, ahem, do Zink, and sits down. His mother and father look at each other. His sister Polly says, you know what? And then this too is over. And like the best friendship, it's over before he knows it. In fact, it has never been quite what he thought it was in the first place. One day, Zinkoff notices that except for Katie Snelson and a few others, no one smiles at him anymore. No one is high-fiving him. No one yo zinking him. He thinks about it, and he figures he knows why. Field day is coming, and no one takes field day more seriously than fifth graders. And that's what Zinkoff thinks it is, merely a turning of attention from himself to field day. He has heard his last yo, seen his last smile. Okay, he thinks, no problem. And he puts on his own game face. He brings chairs from the kitchen to the backyard and practices the weave around the chairs race and the one foot hop and the hiney hop. He goes out onto the sidewalk and just as he did when he was little, he races cars to the end of the block and it surprises him that the cars seem so much faster these days. He does jumping jacks. Meanwhile, in school, Gary Hobbin is rising to prominence as he does every year around field daytime. Field day is still two weeks away when Hobbin goes to Mrs. Shankfelder and asks her to pick the four teams now. We want to have time to practice together, he says. So Mrs. Shankfelder writes across the top of the green board, red, yellow, purple, green. Then she writes each student's name on a slip of paper and mixes them in a box. She calls Ronnie Joe Thomas up front and tells her to turn her head away and pick a slip from the box. The first name out of the box goes in the red column, the next name in the yellow column, and so on until each student is assigned to a team. Gary Hobbin is yellow. So is Zinkoff. Oh no, blurts Hobbin the moment he sees Zinkoff's name go up under his. Together again. The teacher turns from the board. Pardon me? We can't be on the same team again, Hobbin says. We're supposed to be on different teams each year to make it fair. Mrs. Schenkfelder frowns. Don't be silly. There's no such rule. Hobbin snarls under his breath. There is now. Ten minutes later, Zinkoff receives a note on his desk. The note says, forget yellow. Join another team. On the playground at lunchtime, Hobbin comes to Zinkoff. Did you get the note? Yeah, says Zinkoff. What's it mean? It means what it says. You're not a yellow. Join another team. But I am a yellow. Mrs. Shankfelder said so. Hobbin is taller than Zinkoff. 
He leans down until his eyes are locked into Zinkoff's. Zinkoff can smell the hot dog on his breath. Listen, says Hobbin, you're not going to make me lose again. There's no way you're going to be on my team. You understand? Forget it. Zinkoff is confused. A week ago, Hobbin was high-fiving him and calling him the Zink. And now this? But I practice, says Zinkoff. I'm good now. Hobbin laughs. You're a loser. You lose. Go lose with somebody else. You're not a yellow. He walks off, turns back. And you can't even walk right. It's in Zinkoff's mind to say, but I got an A. But he knows it will make no difference. Each team has a captain, Hobbin, of course, being captain of the yellows. In the days that follow, Zinkoff approaches each of the other captains and asks if they could use a new member. Each one says no. Zinkoff does not know what to do. He is tempted to tell Miss Shankfelder of his problem and let her handle it, but he thinks better of it. He is too embarrassed to tell his parents to admit that no one wants him on their team. He rubs his lucky pink bubblegum stone, hoping to change his luck, and he continues to practice. If anything, he practices even harder and longer. He is not home for dinner on the last day before field day, and his mother has to send Polly out to find him racing cars two blocks away. And even as he gasps for breath walking home, listening to Polly harp at him, he knows what he will do. He gets up as usual the next day and heads off to school, but he does not arrive. He veers and walks the other way. In the distance, he hears the late bell, and he wants to run to it, but he does not. He walks the streets of town. He looks at his feet, trying to see what Hobbin sees. The town is the same and not the same, the same brick house fronts and sidewalks, but no kids. He feels the picture he lives in has been tilted. He has never been so aware of air. The space around him, he feels like he did when he wandered by mistake into the girls' room. He is the only person he knows to have done so more than once. A woman across the street in a flowery bathrobe leans from her front door to pick up a newspaper on the step. A yellow cat emerging from an air shaft studies him for a moment and darts back in. He tries walking the alleys, and that's worse. He's unhappy everywhere. He is nowhere. He wishes to be somewhere. He wishes to be with people, but he cannot go to school, and he cannot go home. Ultimately, he walks to the 900 block of Willow. As he heads up the sidewalk, he is com comforted to see that the waiting man is there, even at this strange time of day. He waves to the waiting man and aches for a wave in return. It occurs to him to do a silly little dance to see if the waiting man will smile, but he chickens out. Claudia, the little girl in the harness, is not outside today. He is tempted to knock on the door. Can Claudia come out and play? How silly would that sound? Him, 11 years old? Oh, mailman! He turns. She's across the street, leaning on the walker. He runs to her. He wants to hug her. He's so happy she's there. Hi, he says. Hi, she says. It sounds funny. Hi, coming from such an old person. He has the impression he could teach her to speak like a talking bird. She reminds him of a bird. The thin legs sticking out from the bathrobe. School mornings must be the time of bathrobes. Come on in, she says, as if she knows he needs to be someplace. She doesn't say, what are you doing here? It's a school day. She doesn't say, what's going on? Or where's your bike? She just says, come on in, as if this all happens all the time. He goes in. The end of that chapter, love you.